G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Thank you so much for checking out today's podcast. Before we get into all of the draft action, unpacking it with Lenny, I do have a message for you from our sponsors. Now Christmas is just about here, so I know everyone's looking for stocking stuffers for their loved ones, but thankfully Manscaped, our sponsors today, are able to help out. They have the tools to help you win this year's White Elephant or Stocking Stuffer competition. Manscaped is the only brand completely dedicated to men's below the belt grooming and thankfully they have just launched across Europe, Canada and of course Australia. Now you can forget about the old manual way of shaving your nuts. The previously arduous task of manscaping has never been easier. The cool thing about Manscaped as well is that when you buy the perfect package 3.0 you get a number of different stocking stuffer gifts as well. First of all you've got the crop preserver ball deodorant and some of you will need this more than you would care to admit. That is going in Daniel Bush's stocking stuffer. Then you've got the crop mop ball wipes. You never know when you'll need these, especially if you're on a night out. It's summer's coming up here in Australia. You meet a lovely lady. You might need these right in your pocket. Then of course, you've got the crop arriver ball toner, which actually has active pH control in case your nuts are a little acidic. On top of that, you can purchase the foot duster foot deodorant designed to keep even the stankiest feet smelling fresh. Then there's actually the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer with a ceramic blade skin safe technology so you can get rid of those nasty little nose hairs. And let's not forget the main attraction, the actual trimmer itself. Like the Weed Whacker, it's got a replaceable ceramic blade with skin safe technology to reduce all your grooming incidents. And for your peace of mind, these products and formulations are vegan, they're cruelty free, they're dye free, they're sulfate free, and they're paraben free, so you know these products are legitimate. The reason I'm telling you about these products today is because with our sponsorship with manscaped.com, you can actually get their products with 20% off. So with Christmas around the corner, I know we're all thinking about ideas to get our dad, our brothers, our mates, something cool for Christmas. Well, you've got a number of suggestions right here. You'll probably get a laugh out of it, but I guarantee it'll be a product they actually use. So don't forget guys, go to manscaped.com, use the discount code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, all one word, you will get 20% off the products and you will get free shipping as well. On top of having great products, these guys help us produce the podcast in the way that we do and we're very, very grateful for their support. So please consider us if you are going to make a purchase there. Thanks guys, let's get into the podcast. All right. Here we are for the 67th True Footy Podcast, just two away from the sexy podcast that is uh, nice. coming up. Do you have anything planned for that one? Probably just saying nice yeah. in an enthusiastic manner, but we'll see what comes to mind. I like how you couldn't help yourself in True Footy Podcast 66 when you said execute podcast yeah, right. It was there, I had to take it. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Lenny, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me thank again. You, thank you for joining us. Um, again, very um, highly sought after, after guests, like lots of people in our DMs saying, When's Lenny coming on for the uh, for the potty? So thank you for taking the time again. Also on the live stream, we did a live stream for the for the draft, uh, which both you boys and Drewzy attended. So you can, anyone can go back and watch that. That was good fun. Um, you must be almost sick of us. No, absolutely <laughs> not. I'm loving it. It's almost like I've just moved in here. I've yeah. really left in the last two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, think yeah. I only had one trip to Melville in between, but yeah, I don't know, yeah. Maybe I've pretty much resided here true true yeah um you are a resident true footy draft expert so um we thank you for the value that you you bring the show um so today obviously we'll talk a little bit about the the draft that was um we'll try not to overlap too much with uh i guess the stuff we covered in the pre-draft stuff yeah. uh, which anyone can go back and watch because it's obviously still relevant um lenny gives great insight into the draft prospects and uh, obviously we also had a potty with jack avery so this is actually your fourth podcast plus a live stream so yeah you're you're actually a well-seasoned guest he's uh, catching louis <laughs> yeah you are catching louis louis was the guy that briefly started the show with us and right. then has not been since, since seen since he's like, a well-traveled man yeah he, to say with louis. he keeps leaving the state but um but yeah, anyway, so we'll, I guess we'll do a little bit of a reaction to the draft. Yep. Um, first of all, I guess, what did you guys think of the draft as a spectacle? Um, did, do you have any... Spectacle-wise, like, the, the length of time between picks was too long in terms of making it, like, an entertaining spectacle for, like, people to really get behind towards the end. I was a bit fried, i got to admit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for other reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, just kidding, Brilliant. just kidding. Sponsors don't get scared by that um, <laughs> <laughs> you can watch the full live stream he's talking out his old uh what did you think lenny oh uh, i agree a bit with busha i think the um length of time between the picks was a bit too long especially mm. for the first round when you clubs would have been expected to know who they're picking yeah i doubt adelaide would have really needed the full five minutes to choose someone like riley thilthorpe yeah to or put the bid on on um the bulldogs jamari eagle hagen so 
I think for the first round next year on Reds, I think they need to reduce it from five minutes to three minutes. Mm -hmm. And then maybe second round onwards, you can have it as five minutes. I mean, obviously this year's draft was very compromised in that Victorians didn't play at all. Um, and SA and both WA had half season. So it was probably a bit difficult for those second and third round um, picks. But I think in the future, when we hopefully get a lot more football, uh, the first round should really be down to three minutes. Yeah, I think I think in the past it's been the first round's been longer and the, the rest has been two minutes or yeah, three minutes, if I'm not I've mistaken. Usually experienced. Yeah, I think the idea is that um, they use the five minute allotment, even though, you know, Adelaide would have probably buzzed in their answer yeah. straight away. They use that entire time for presentation and like building the, yeah. the profile of the player. The show, and then, of yeah. the, the show side of it. Yeah. And also in previous years gone by, they'd always get the top 10 boys to come up with true. the photo and the jumpers. Yeah. So. That's true. Yeah, that's it. Um, but how funny was it at the start? I'm sure we didn't imagine this when it said, uh, was it Adelaide's pick? Yeah. For, so the first live pick of the draft and it said a trade has been done? Yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> that threw us completely. I was, yeah. I was like, who well, the hell is trading for Adelaide? There was a bit of talk about um, Adelaide or North looking at yeah. trading their first pick for multiple picks. So Yeah, that would have really spiced it up. But I did think it was kind of a, a, a juicy kind of top 10 anyway. Like, yeah. um, we'll get to it, I guess. But like the top three in particular is one where probably no phantom draft nailed it. And that's rare for a top three. Generally, yeah. the top three has a consensus and it's accurate. But we got some surprises all the way down. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, we'll, we'll start at the top, obviously. Oogle Hagen was matched um, and became the Bulldogs' number one selection. Um, probably don't need to go on at length about how good he is because we, we have covered I it. I think something that's pretty special about it is that he's the first Indigenous player to be selected at number one since Des Headland in 1998, no. I believe. Yeah, so, right. I think that's quite a remarkable achievement. Um, and look, what a great uh, status he's already got going into the game. Yeah, he does. He's, uh, he's talked about as a, as a buddy-like talent, which is not something you, you come across. I think the last player I remember hearing talked about like this was Jack Martin in 2013. 12? I think 2013 would have been his draft year. Yeah, he got second so draft with yeah. Jesse Hogan in exactly. 2012. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so yeah, we're talking about a prodigious talent there and the Bulldogs have just got an absolute freebie there, which is... Insane. Um, and of course, Adelaide stayed local, picking yep. Tilthorpe over um, McDonald. Now, pick three for North. I think most people had them linked to um, McDonald or Hollands, if yes. I'm not mistaken. So, And that's probably where I would have thought as well. But they obviously went with Will Phillips. Yep. What did you think on that selection? Oh, look, I think if you watch the live stream, I'm a bit perplexed by him. Mm. But the more I think about it, He's a real consistent sort of midfielder. and So it's sort of like a Jai Simpkin. And because Sean Higgins has gone, he can almost replace that inside-outside midfielder role, if that makes sense. Um, and the other thing is North Melbourne's now wanting to get really good leaders into that football club. And he certainly is a great leader. Um, you know, Matty Rendell was quite big on him. I know Mick Ablett was big on him. And I know a few other recruiters were quite big on him. So... It probably wasn't a primary list need, as North Melbourne probably needed, but he's certainly going to be a great play for that club. Yeah, I agree in that, um, like his record and sorry, his like reputation stands up really well. I think I was saying on the um, on the live stream, Chris Dory was um, for, aka Nightmare from Big Footy said that he was at least as good a prospect as Rao was last year. So yeah. um, he's got a big rap sheet. He's um, he's a prodigious talent. I guess for me, the only question mark was. North have gone heavy with their midfield, so they've yeah. obviously taken um, uh, Young Phillips. Phillips, thank you. Uh, and then they went Powell in yeah. with pick thirteen as well, and then kind of went with mids and forwards after that. I do wonder if they've missed an opportunity when they've got a top two pick or top three pick yeah. to pick like a next generation talent yeah. key forward. Yeah, do you know key what I mean? Or key defender as well. Exactly. So, so you had Granger Barras, you had um, McDonald on the board, yeah. but obviously they just thought Phillips was the. The safest bet, I guess, but I, yeah, yeah, he know. seems like the highest floor sounding. Well, maybe not Logan. Actually, Logan's got a pretty high floor, really, as far as a key forward, mm. which is rare in some mm. sense. But yeah, I guess Phillips seems to have a pretty high floor from consensus. Like midfielders generally seem to have a higher floor, yeah. whether or not that's accurate. But even comparing him to other midfielders like Hollands and stuff, like Hollands probably has the potential to do more exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But Phillips has just got that floor of get you posy solid, yeah. dependable. Yeah, for sure. Wherever not, he can be special, he can build on it, but he's got that dependable floor. I guess the way I describe it is it's not a bad pick. It's probably going to turn out really well for him because yep. it's a safe pick, but I uh, wonder if it was a slightly 
conservative pick that, you know, if Logan McDonald becomes mm. like a, a gun key forward with Ben Brown obviously leaving yeah. the club, um, we'll see what happens there. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the Swans then, who were... Um, back to back. Back to back, yeah. So obviously went Logan McDonald. And this was a funny one as well. Yeah. I think nobody really called this because we didn't expect... Uh, well, I didn't ex- personally expect McDonald to be on the board still yeah. for Sydney. Um, and then even if he was there, I thought they were more likely to go with the key back in Granger Barras. But uh, what, what did you think of Sydney's pick of McDonald? Oh, look, I was a bit like you. I thought they were more likely to go to someone like Denver with that pick. But I suppose maybe another thing they're wondering is Buddy is a lot more near the end than he is the beginning, which is sad. But, you know, maybe they're hoping that they can Buddy can teach Logan a few tricks um, and... Look, key forwards, they don't grow on trees. And their defence is still relatively settled. I know, you know, Dane Rampey's still young. You've got Jake Lloyd down there. Callum Mills is still down there. So they might not be big key defenders, but their defence is sorted out enough that they can probably take a risk getting that key forward. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think, obviously, they tried and failed to get Danaher over the last 12 to 24 months. Yeah. Um, so there's obviously they've identified key forward as a need, so that it does make sense. And you look at their young key forwards, um, you got Blakey who is really talented, but he yeah. could end up you know like a big rangy midfielder at this rate. Yeah. There's no guarantee he becomes a key forward at the next level. Yeah. And then Tommy McCartan as well, who's sort of a bit of a swing man for them because yeah. he plays down back, he can go forward, he's exactly a pinch hit in the ruck. So. I think the fact that Tommy McCann can go back probably allows for Sydney to go for someone like a McDonald. Yes. And he's a kind of, if I'm not mistaken, he's a little bit shorter, not kind of the same kind of power forward that McDonald is, like a real number one target. McDonald, sorry, McCartan's probably more the guy that compliments him when yeah. he's playing yeah. forward. So yeah. um, I think from a list perspective, yeah, Sydney has done well here. They could have used to key back, but yeah. I, I think they've probably made the right decision here. I think Sydney were real big winners out of this draft because mm. they were able to get that. Uh, star-studded talent in Logan. Yeah. But then they've got the two academy boys yes. as well through the door, which is quite a um, feather in the cap to Kenny Bates and then the rest of that Sydney Swans recruiting team. Yeah, when you've got two academy boys as well, it makes it more clear that, in my opinion, that they probably needed to go tall with that first pick, obviously yep. with those two boys on the board. So if they, I think it would have probably been a little bit of a waste if they'd gone, say, a Hollands or a, yeah. or a Phillips if he was on the board yep. and then added... Um, Another two midfielders. Yeah, is it Golden? Is that yeah, his name? Golden, Errol and then Golden. obviously Campbell, Errol Golden. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, with Sydney's list here, we're talking a little bit on the stream here. I can't help but feel. Do you feel like their rebuilds almost kind of coming to an end? Like they've almost got yeah. all the talent they need yeah. to really push up. They've yeah. certainly got some of the best talent, as oh, far as I'm concerned, in the league. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Certainly, and I think another thing that's quite exciting for Sydney fans is. If Campbell does come in and play from round one next year, it allows someone like Isaac Heaney to play as a permanent hybrid forward. Mm. And as I was saying in the live stream, they're probably the most valuable commodities in the game right now. Yeah. Or with the forward midfielders, you look at, you know, your Isaac Heaney's, your Geordie DeGoey's, your Jake Stringer's, and they're sort of the players that can just rip open a game. Even yeah. the guys like Dusty and like Whitfield. Whitfield was playing a bit that role and yeah. doing really well in it like that. Where they're on that half four, they mm, swing yeah. for a guard, it's a bit of both. Like, yeah. Yeah. He, Even not necessarily those like borderline 190 guys, those guys yeah. are a bit shorter, still yeah. play that role pretty well as well. He looks, um, he's a player that gets compared a little bit to Petrarca because they're similar age, similar, not style, but maybe yeah. position in the forward mid. And obviously, we saw Petrarca break out and we saw Heaney on the verge of breaking out this year. And obviously, he did his foot, yeah, he got yeah. ruined by injury, but he had to like kick four goals in round one and just yeah. he just looks ready to that, take yeah. that next step. So, the fact that he's like 24 yeah. um, and then, you know, guys like Florent and Hayward that I'm really big on as well. Yeah. Papley's still pretty young. Yeah. Jordan Dawson down back. Like, yeah, I, I'm looking at Sydney, I think. back in, in addition to the fact that they've got such a good culture of developing talent and the fact that they've got really good talent, I think they're really well poised. Yeah, so. And their veterans are still playing really well and yeah. knowing what their culture's like, the veterans are going to pass down the information yeah. right down. And like we talked about a couple of potties, I think it was ago, Luke Parker's only like 27 or some shit, one of you guys mentioned. A few yeah, I think he's, he might be 28, he's a year older than me, yeah. but yeah, that's... Still you know, younger than you'd think. Five years in him. Because yeah. um, like we mentioned, you lump him in with those old farts for, for the <laughs> midfield. Not old farts, but you know what I mean. You trap him in with those old, far, old farts, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, like, Sydney's midfielders have good, um, like, longevity. Like, yeah. they generally play into well, the early mid-30s. JK is only 30, I think he's 35, so... Is he? Yeah. Really? Gee whiz. Wow. There you go. But, um, yeah, obviously, yeah, things looking good at Sydney, to say the least. We'll look at Hawthorne now. This is a pick that... Um, 
for I think two years in a row this is their earliest pick in a while or maybe that's not quite true but uh, anyway it's the earliest pick since um, Mitch Thorpe in like 2006 so yeah. everyone's talking about how important it is for Hawthorne to nail this pick yep. because they haven't had access to that top talent for a, a long time um, I th- they're always a question mark Hawthorne as I was saying in the stream because I feel like they're the sort of team who would who'd reach and pick someone that might not be the consensus pick f- but then f- looking at their list I think talls were pretty much the one thing they really needed. Yeah. So I think Granger Brass is the man. Do you think he was kind of a bargain at pick six? Because he, he probably fell a little bit further than I expected. Oh, look, I'm certainly biased. Um, mm. I think he's certainly a bargain. I think on talent alone, Denver could have been a top three talent mm. uh, in the draft. And the Hawks have got him at pick six. Um, you know, they've lost Sicily for this year because I think Sicily's out, still out yeah, with an ACL. Yeah, ACL. So, Suddenly, they, and the thing that really I think people might not understand truly about Denver's game is he's a beautiful kick out defence. So, mm. and you know, you saw it with Collingwood this year when Jeremy Howe went out, they didn't have that replacement. Whereas now that Sicily's out, they've brought in Denver. And look, I think hopefully he can uh, come out and play 150 games for that club. Yeah, I think. I think that's even conservative based on like how talented he is. He could probably play even more. Like, yeah. I think I I was saying this, and then I think I found the actual article to back it up. But there was um there was an article where they um, anonymously interviewed like twelve out of the eighteen uh, clubs about who would go pick one, and yeah. several said Granger Brass, like three or four at least, said yeah. that he was they would have taken him pick one yeah. if they had the choice. Which is interesting because it shows how different draft boards would look if different clubs had pick one yeah. um, so it's always a little I bit think different the thing especially with this draft compared to 2018 and 2019 because in both those years it was Sam Walsh and Matt Rowell from January of yes. that respective mm. years whereas this year you know you had clubs going Jamara Thilfort McDonald Grant Barras probably not really Hollands because of yeah. his injury but yeah. I think if Hollands had a full year he might have certainly come into that mix mm. yeah. yeah I think that's fair to say as well again the Victorian kids had had less data on them, and I think I said this in the stream as well. It's hard to, it's crazy how some of these Victorian kids haven't played in twelve to eighteen months, and yet they're good enough that they still go top ten, or in Jamara's yeah. case, to pick one. So that I mean, they, we're talking about some seriously good kids. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Um, then we had the G, uh, sorry, the GCS. We had the Gold Coast Suns, um, who, if you read all the Phantoms and stuff, might have been planning for a Will Phillips. It yep. seemed like he was the, the player that was linked to them. Yep. Friends of um, Raul and Anderson, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And a similar sort of pick to, that, to Raul, like I alluded to. But I kind of can't help but feel North almost did them a favour here. And I say that with the utmost respect to Phillips, but I do think... I had a similar thought, actually, but go on. I was thinking Holland's, in terms of a point of difference to their midfield, which is yep. something you, I've heard you talk about a lot. Um, yep. it, it's such a benefit. Holland's is... Da- like dynamic and different again to all the midfielders that they have on their list whereas Phillips maybe comes in yeah. as I don't want to say another Raul but there's the Raul obviously Jr. yeah Raul Jr there's a little bit less of a point of difference yeah. what, are, what are you views on that? I think so so I'm going to use two West Coast players as comparisons for those boys so um, Phillips is more like your Andrew Gaff like that real consistent midfielder works really hard he'll get the 30 touches Yeah. whereas Hollands is like your Luke Shuey that can burst mm. from the contest he's got the raw power the speed the class the skills so what now happens is because Hollands now goes up to Gold Coast opposition clubs looking at that midfield might be going you know who do we tag do we tag mm. Roll? do we tag Hollands do we tag Anderson Miller's going to be their tagger now. So suddenly they've got a really solid midfield. And one bloke who I think is really underrated, I'm not sure if you guys read him, but Jared Witts, I mm, think is a very, very, he's one of the best ruckmen yep. in the league. So, sure. so I have him at about three behind like the big two. Yeah. I have him at three myself. Yeah, so suddenly they've got a great ruckman who's tapping it down to three prodigious talents. I mean, they're going to be a damn good team in mm. a couple of years. Yeah, it's and undeniable. you can just see it with Ben King up forward as well. They've got Rankin... Yeah, I'm I'm very bullish about the Gold Coast. Yeah, me too. I've, I've said this a number of times, but this is the probably the most talented list they've ever had, actually, including when they first yeah. you know came to the league and drafted yeah. your Swallow Day and Bunnell. Yeah. It's easy to say because it's early. Yeah. But you look at like since they took Lacocious Rankin and um ben and, and Ben King and then added Raul and Anderson yeah. now Elijah Hollands, yeah. um Sam Flanders is in there somewhere. Yeah. Jeremy yeah. Sharp, the players that you forget yeah. about that they're still first and second yeah. rounders. 
um, it's starting to pile up. Oh, it really is. Um, and I think the other thing that's now really exciting from a Gold Coast perspective is they've got some mature bodies in there. Mm. So, you know, when they, when they had 40, 18 year old kids, it was always going to be hard for them to keep that talent and for them to really learn about the game. And another thing that I really liked about Gold Coast drafting was in the rookie draft, they drafted Jacob Townsend. Yeah, yeah that was so a nice that's another job. mature body that can go in there. He can help alleviate some of the pressure on a Roland and Anderson as well. So, um, yeah, I think what they're doing right now is they're building a very special team. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying next year they're going to become premiers or they're going to dominate the whole comp, but I, I can see a very, very bright future up at that club. I agree with you. I agree with you for sure. Uh, we'll move down to Essendon as well. Um, and Essendon had three picks here. And I did think when when a club has a bunch of picks in a row or around the same mark, sometimes you see them reach or sometimes you see someone bolt because they've got a little bit of like that, that, leeway. Ability. that leeway. Exactly right. But f- this is almost the most predictable three picks out of the I whole think top it ten. Was. In fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, right before in the live stream, I think you actually called the exact three players that they took. I think the... It's because I saw it as a way that, um, you know, they needed keys because mm. Hooker, Hurley are both 30 plus. Yep. Dan Hurst just left, so they're a bit uh, low on the key forward stocks. They even got rid of like McKernan and Mitch Brown or yeah. one of those two, something like that. Mm. Yeah, so McKernan. they yeah. really had to get the um, big keys in. And then an area which I thought they had been lacking for quite a few years was just that big bodied midfielder. Mm. I mean, they hadn't really replaced that since Job left. Exactly. Um, and look, once they get a bit more size and a bit more pre-seasons in this belt, Archie Perkins could be a great player for that club. Um, he got to stay home, so he'll be happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But And then you look at someone like a Christian Petrarca who took maybe a couple of years before he really fulfilled that his uh, potential. And that's something I can see in Archie Perkins. So... Give him a bit of time and he could just become a fantastic player for that club. Yeah, that's it. I think sometimes the Petrarca example is interesting because in a lot of ways he's ready-made, but like when he was drafted rather because he's physically built. Yeah. But to have the same competitive advantage at AFL level as you do in juniors, you yeah. still you need to develop again. It's not yeah. as though you can come in and be that explosive player at yeah. AFL level at the yeah. same time. And the thing is with Petrarca as well, like he looked good young, like because he hadn't been playing basketball. Oh, sorry, football for that long because he was a basketball guy, like all through like the academies and stuff. And then yeah. switched to footy, so he had that athletic ability which helped him stand out in the 18s mm. to yeah. get to where he was. But then he needed to add the skills that he probably would have got if he'd played from like under eight, so his kick sort of thing. Very true. Yeah. So I he get- sort of probably caught up in that aspect of his game now that he's been in the system being able to learn that stuff for a few years I think something that's interesting about Petrarca was when he did his knee uh, in his first year we all thought we got robbed of seeing this Mm. prodigious talent the next generation um, just classy player but it probably helped him condition his body in a lot of ways so he probably had to lose the too much excess weight So now you look at him, even though he's still big, he's quite lean big. Mm. Whereas probably when he first got drafted, he was probably a bit too over big. Um, and look, if that's the sort of player, that's the sort of player who I would implore Archie Perkins to model his game on. For you know, sure. be that dangerous play forward, go into the midfield, and then in year four, year five, really explode out. Exactly, yeah. I guess I, I, my point was to sort of, I guess, urge patience with these kind of explosive players. Like using the Petrarca example, like the advantage that he had over those kids, he goes into the AFL system and he doesn't have that advantage yeah. because yeah. everyone's physically developed. So yeah. he has to wait, become bigger again, and he's obviously genetically predisposed yeah. that he can become a, a beast, which he yeah. has. Um, has a great podcast with Dylan Friends as well. That yeah. came out about a month ago, I want to say. So he seems like a good bloke as well. But enough about Petrarca. We're talking about yeah. Essendon here. I don't even know how we got yeah, there. I don't know how we got to We're talking about yeah. this year's draft and Essendon. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're talking about Perkins. Um, but yeah, no, so I guess would you have done anything different um, was the, the other question I had for Essendon or are you pretty satisfied with the way they've gone for it? No, I think they absolutely nailed those picks. And when I spoke to uh, my mentor last night, Michael Ablett... Cool. Uh, Name drop. Yep. He... Um, <laughs> Yeah, he even said that they nailed those picks. So yeah. I think they really did the list needs that they needed to do and they probably got that area that they really needed to address. Yeah, I, I think... I loved their antics late too, oh. Essendon, with the bids and then just 
pulling out of the draft. Oh yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> just drop a bidding on a few and then pass. Yeah, that really <laughs> classic Dodoro. I loved it. Didn't add to the spectacle much at all. <laughs> <laughs> like fuck, especially when I was. The, I think the Eagles' first pick was right after, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So I was just like. Hanging you were out. hoping they wouldn't take someone. A window. Yeah, Izzy yeah, window. Yeah, but we will yeah. we will get to that. So I think I think it's fair to say Essendon needed to nail this draft considering yeah. their trade period where more went out than in. I think yeah. that's fair to say. But um, fingers crossed it's early days, but uh, it looks like they've made smart decisions. Yeah. We'll talk about two other clubs. Oh, actually, no, before we get into that, I want to talk about Adelaide here because yes. they had the very next pick with Luke Pedler, the local yeah. boy, 183 centimetre midfielder, I want to say. Yep. Yeah. And I think this, if I'm not mistaken, is considered the biggest reach of the draft, yeah. or at least the biggest bolter. Yeah. Do you have a strong opinion on Pedler at all? Uh, do you rate the call uh, um, that they made? Um, to be honest, I think Kane Corns actually said something that I actually really did agree with. And yeah. that, uh, I haven't typically agreed with Kane. Dead clock's right twice a day, I guess, with um, Kane. <laughs> but um, what he's really said was, were Adelaide really spooked about, you know, that they had to take the local boys mm. before um, the Victorian boys? Now, that's not saying that, you know, I'm saying that Victorian boys were better than their player they picked, but they also had a kid called Tommy Powell, who was right under their nose. Yeah. He's around the mark. Um, unfortunately, I haven't really seen Luke play a lot of football. Sure. Um, so I'm probably not well qualified to speak on the sort of player he is, how he adds to that list. But when he's rated at pick 50 and you're taking him at pick 11, yeah. he, you're hoping he is going to be a very special talent. Yeah, well, the last time, I think one of the biggest bolters I've ever seen, other than Blaine Pocos in 2014, was Tom Dode uh, in, yeah. um, oh, I couldn't even tell you, honestly, uh, 2016, 2017? 15, I think. It was that long ago. Mm. There you go. Um, I had literally not heard of the guy and he went in the first round and I... I'm not an expert, but I followed the draft extensively enough where if a guy goes in the first round that I haven't heard, it's weird. Yeah. So when... when oh, I was a bit shocked as well. Yeah, right, yeah. So. And it turned out to be a great pick. Uh, yeah. Other than his injury issues, Dode's like yeah. well and truly repaid the faith. So maybe Pedler um, is of the same sort of ilk, who knows. Yeah. But I, I think we could see with the Adelaide strategy, they have gone local a lot, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I think yeah. they picked like three or four South Australian boys. I don't have it written down in front of me. They, they also picked up a couple of mature age Right. Um, picks as well, which really helps that list yeah. because now suddenly you're not getting six, seven, eight, ten year old kids that you've really got to start putting a lot of time yep. in. And in fact, one of the places is actually Stephen Rose's son, who's a former Adelaide person, that oh. Adelaide media personality. Yeah, I saw a bit of a thing on Instagram where he was pretty emotional about how his kid got drafted. He nice. was like crying, yeah, saying so how proud of him he was and stuff. It was pretty wholesome. Yeah, but I think overall it's actually been a good draft for Adelaide. They've got some natural talent through the door, which is what they really needed. Uh, it's local talents and they're probably not going to lose them but mm. you hope that next year they start to look a bit outside South Australia yeah well. yeah I think other than the fact that they have retention issues and maybe wanted to pick the local boy for that yep. then you also look at the fact that they're rebuilding this is one of their most important drafts of this rebuild no doubt because they had what became pick two um, so it also makes sense that they didn't go for the Victorian kids who they know less about. So yeah. to go with the local boy, they just know a bit, have a bit more access to him. Yeah. Um, Especially this year. Yeah, it's conservative yeah. and you can you can actually see why they've done it. Even though, like you said, Pedler was still um, a surprise when Joyce is right there. But yeah, I think Adelaide have backed them. Actually, I think it's very fair to say Adelaide are a very good recruiting team. Yeah. It's the retention that's been the issue, but they've yeah. generally drafted and developed talently well. So... We'll see what happens well, there. I remember Matty Rendell picked up Dangerfield before any other club yeah. really yeah. had done their analysis on him. So, yep. And it's, I think it's fair to say that Dane just become one of the best players in the competition. Yeah, and I think even just plucking Charlie Cameron out of the rookie draft just off the top yep. of my head, Tom Dodo, like we alluded yep. to, um, it's actually almost worth a video in itself, actually, looking at Adelaide's recruitment because I think they've done a really good job over the stretch. Um, but we want to, want to talk about a couple of clubs here that um, obviously were... Under the spotlight in the trade period for the wrong reasons, um, we've touched a little bit about uh, one of them in particular. We kind of talked about Essendon already, but we'll move on to Collingwood first, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. A team that you know had a PR disaster. Yeah. Trelaw left the club. Stevenson left the club. Didn't really have a strong draft hand going into this year. They yeah. talked about you know let's we, we really uh, want to invest in this year's draft, but they just held two team picks and yeah. then a pick sixty five or something stupid. Yeah. They managed to turn that into, I think, five top 31 picks and yep. then another pick later. Um, and that include uh, Oliver Henry, Finley McRae, um, Reef McInnes, their yep. academy pick, uh, Caleb Poulter and uh, McMahon as well. Yep. I guess, how did you rate the way they went about it? Oh, I think they're one of the biggest winners of the draft. Um, they got, obviously, Finley McRae and Oliver Henry before the um, bid on their academy boy mm. in um, Reef McInnes, who... Again, Reef could have been a top 10, top 15 talent, and they got him in the 20s. 
Um, yeah, I think they absolutely nailed this draft. Um, I'm not sure how they can trans. I think their trade period was still that much of a PR disaster. Mm. I'm not sure this really alleviates a lot of it, but it's a, certainly a step in the right direction. I agree with you. I think although they've really certainly got to learn about uh, the list sizes and the list yeah. contracts. True. Because that's that that was their downfall. Mm-hmm. I think their culture is fantastic. Even when I've spoken to Trey Rusco, oh yeah, before, he reckons that yeah the culture there is absolutely fantastic. So that's cool. What were you gonna I say? was going to say I think they got lucky to an extent with this draft, like having guys like Henry and McRae fall into their laps to an extent. Like, like obviously they've taken the they've lucky enough to have them fall in their pick, and they did the right thing in taking those guys, yeah. but. They probably did get lucky that those guys fell to them a bit, I think especially before the bid. I think like it's fair to say... makes them look better than maybe they might have been. Sure. Considering they <laughs> ended up dumping that future first for, like, what was it, pick 30 or something? No, I don't think it was that. I think because uh, they they had two top they, more f- 31 picks, considering that they, they needed to get... their future re- first real cheap, mm-hmm. though. It, well, I don't know how... Oh, it's hard to say in front of us, mm-hmm. without it in front of us, but I don't <laughs> think it was too bad in the sense that... The other thing is they it's also, not much use to them. They so. also get Nick Dacos next year. Yeah, yeah well. exactly. He's already seen as the number one pick. So that's probably why they were probably like, well, future first round. That's why they got rid of it. Talent but they, they've known that for a while. They could have got something better for it prior than like pick 26 or 30 or whichever. Maybe. Like. I thought, I. it's hard to say. I, I thought they've essentially gone using two first rounders to get... Um, or two extra first rounds to get Dacos and Reef. Yeah. So I think you can really see that they're starting to now invest in that future. They mm. probably know they're probably going to be a couple more years away from genuinely contending. Yeah. Um, and so when they were contending after 2018, that's probably why they went after a Beams, because they just knew yes. if mm. you get someone like him into that midfield, suddenly they just look even more dangerous. But unfortunately, that didn't work out for them. So now what they've done is they've gone, okay, we're going to have a couple more years before we're really right up at the top. And let's develop some game time into these kids and hopefully they can then take us forward. Mm. And they'll probably be hoping for some organic growth as well from within their club. Yeah, I think think that's true. I think there was a little degree of luck um, in that the bid for McInnes came after their second pick because obviously if that happens, then they lose different picks. So I guess there's a bit of luck there. But um, the fact that they've ended up with five top 31 picks when previously they didn't have a good draft hand at all and that next year's first doesn't mean as much to them. Yeah. I think they've rescued what could have been a very bad situation and I think yeah. it's made it's, they've made it into a positive and I think looking at their youth I think they've done well over the stretch. Okay, Quaino a couple of years ago is an academy player who kind yeah. of fell into their hands, but generally speaking they've been able to add youth pretty consistently along the way um, and Nick Dacos next year. I think I think they're in a good position in that sense. It just remains to be seen the fallout from you know, the devastating PR disaster um, that we saw from their trade period. But, yeah, I guess that remains to be seen. The Giants are another team that lost a lot of players. Yep. Um, so, I guess the way I was going to fr- phrase this question was, to what extent have the Giants replenished their stocks? I don't know if they can adequ- adequately replenish losing Jeremy Cameron, yeah. Zach Williams. Um, Jackson Haley walked out the door, former first round draft Jai pick. Jai Caldwell. Jai Caldwell, so. yep. Yeah, um, and probably someone else that I'm completely forgetting. Aiden Core. Aiden Core. Um, top 10 in their BNF, if I'm not mistaken. Something so, like actually, that. pretty handy player. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we'll look at the players they did get. They got uh, Tanner Brun, yep. Connor Stone, Angwin, Fleeter, and Ware. I must admit, I don't know anything about Angwin, Fleeter, or Ware. Um, yeah. Angwin surprised me because I think he went pick 18. Yeah. wasn't a player that I was particularly familiar with. Yeah. But what, I guess, generally speaking, how did you feel about GWS's mix here in what is a very important draft for them? Well, again, speaking to some people and hearing from some people in the media about the draft, Connor Stone's going to be an absolute mm. star for that club. I think Matty Rendell came out and just said he reminded him of a young danger feel. Wow. As in, we're talking 16, 17-year-old Paddy, not... Mm you know, 28, but yeah, yeah. less Patty. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Tanner Bruins always been on the board. I know he had the stone cold face on him. Yeah, he did. But he? Um, look, I think he'll get up there. He'll love it. He's a country boy. Um, and I think I said in the live stream, it's easier to relocate a country boy than it is a city boy. Mm. Um, so look, I think they're on the right path. For them, they're a bit like Adelaide. They've just got to start retaining these players and yeah. build up another quality team because they've still got the talent. Like Toby Green's oh, yeah. still there, Whitfield's still there, uh, Cornelio's still there. Um, so they've got a lot of talent still in that team. They're good enough to win the flag, I reckon. Yeah. I, I, I know that they didn't have a great year last year and lost a lot of players, but 
that's the thing with them though every year they have a bit of a revolving door and they're still sort of yeah. talented enough to stay in the hunt of it but that's the, core the issue the players are good enough yeah. the ones that are still there are, but they're starting to lose like a core guy like every couple yeah. of years like they've lost Jez Cameron they've lost some other guys who you'd probably say could have been yeah, major I, guys from like Shield even yeah I, not, so extent, much not so much Shield but he's an example of like a bigger name but they've lost Cameron is the, probably Cameron's the biggest, the biggest one, one by say. a mile yeah. Yeah. Well, when you're losing a Coleman medalist who's yeah. like a generational K4 and you... Mm. Yeah, it's hard to replenish that um, overall. But yeah, I don't know. I think it'll be remain to be, it remains to be seen, obviously, with the Giants because they're generally good at picking players, but they ended up obviously end up like shipping them off for second round is after a couple of years. I do wonder if we'll see that steady a little bit now, now yeah. that they... We do say that every year as well. After Shield yeah. left, I remember thinking they've probably shared all the players they wanted to leave the salary cap's not going to be an issue anymore. They're going to be a normal club now. Mm. And then they yeah. have this off-season. But yeah. it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see what happens there. That's my thing with them. When's that going to stop? Because if that if they're just that sort of club that's sort of like, yeah, we'll develop kids for you for a couple of years. Mm. We'll take them on. Then you can pick them up off us for cheap. I, that's not where you want to be as a club. I made a video of this. I can't remember who it was saying. It could have been Heath Shaw was saying that um, the, the, trick with the, the tricky part with the Giants now is other than the fact that there's a culture where there's less of a stigma to leave. He didn't necessarily say that, but that's kind of me attributing to it. Yep. But, yeah. but then he said, what also happens is that other clubs now just go to the Giants at the end of every season, or not like during the season, and have a bit of a feeding frenzy because they know that there's a history of players leaving now, and now they're a target. Yeah. So heaps of opposition clubs are now just like, going to the Giants before any other club because there's an opportunity there which makes it hard if you're trying to retain a list and that's where Gold Coast's been really good you know they had that issue where clubs would just come in and pick up the talent you know Caddy left a few other players left but now what's happened is not any it's not really relevant now that clubs are going to Gold Coast saying we want to pick up this kid apart from Matt Rowell because the kid's an absolute star but so they've really implemented that great culture there and that's something that GWS need to start uh, I suppose mimicking that blueprint how funny is it that we're saying that GWS needs to look at the Gold Coast blueprint to replicate players? How yeah. funny imagine is it that, that we're saying that? Like a year, <laughs> imagine saying that a year ago, even. Yeah. Even one year ago, that'd be a bit like... I get what you're saying, though. They, they need to re- re-establish a culture where players buy into the yeah. future. Like, I think they had that, and that's why they haven't collapsed, yeah. um, as we have a rampant dog outside. <laughs> no, he's all right. Um, we, yeah, I think they've established that, and that's why they built a side that made the grand final. But obviously yeah. now there's a bit of a an obstacle hit they've lost one of their best players they've lost the grand final in a bit of inner turmoil at the club it'll be interesting to see how they bounce back but we are getting a little bit away from the draft um, but it is an interesting topic this is a WA footy podcast we yep. do talk about the AFL generally but of course yep. we are West Australian um, Ropers. Yeah, West. Uh, we're all Eagles and Dockers fans here and as such a large part of our audience is West Coast and Fremantle supporting so we will take a little bit of a focus on the two WA clubs yep. um, particularly as you get good insight into the WA boys and a lot of these kids are local because it makes sense um, particularly West Coast I I said going into it that we're going to probably be conservative and stay local we'll talk about them first took Luke Edwards um, son of Adelaide great Tyson uh, which is funny because I'm getting to that age now where I have players that I grew up watching their sons are now playing and that just makes me feel like an absolute dad but um yeah he's actually the younger brother of um of another father-son Adelaide had but um anyway obviously so he was non-father-son to to the Crows I think there's a little bit of a fallout there Eagles picked him up and then Izzy Winder is a player I know that you're a little bit familiar with yep. um at Peel Thunder I was really happy with that and then Zane True in the rookie draft is another boy that I know you're familiar with what, what did you think I guess of their hole uh, as in West Coast Hall. Sorry, West Coast Hall specifically, yep. yeah. Um, I think it's great. Um, look, they're hard club to value because their first pick was pick 55 yeah. off, off the top of my head. It was 62 and then it came Pushed forward. Up to 52, I, think I think it might have been 51, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah something yeah, like 51, that. Actually, yeah, 51 actually, yeah, because so, Essendon passed, it was 51. Yeah, mm. so th- that's a club that's really hard to value. And that's not me trying to um, brush them aside. I get it, yeah. But, um, you know, uh, if I can, the uh, two WA boys are both absolutely fantastic kids. I know Zane had got copped a bit of a bake in the media mm. about him, but for the West Coast fans out there that might be a bit worried about that, the kid's a beauty, he's a star. Um, in terms of he'll buy into that club, if he does have a sook, I'll tell you what, Luke Shu is going to pull him into line, <laughs> Yo's going to pull him into line. They've got a great culture there. And I think Izzy and Zane, if they apply themselves correctly, they, they can certainly have long futures at that club. Yeah, well said. I think 
I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Zane True Peter Sumich thing because yep. you know Zane personally, don't you? Yep. So for those who don't know, um, and if you're not WA based, this might not even come across your screens. But Peter Sumich, who was the coach of WA this year, yep. um, former Eagle key forward as well, which adds a little. Oh, I don't know. Sort fair. of because it's an ex Eagles player bagging out the kid they've now taken. I, okay, fair enough. So um, maybe in the context of fans who like back in the day loved Sumich when he kicked shitloads of goals from, we go, oh, Sumich said it. Uh, sure, they attach extra value. He, sort yeah, of I mean again. he wasn't drafted at the time, but anyway, Sumich was after uh, asked his opinion on the WA kids, and he sort of he premised it like I don't like to be negative, but and then basically just gave Zane True a bit of a spray for being um, for being of sook. Yep. And basically, just when things aren't going his way, dropping his head more or less. I'm paraphrasing. Yep. What? First of all, I mean, I thought that was really unprofessional for a start. For this kid's get his draft is next week. Even if it's true, to give him a bake like that in public, yep. I don't know if I've ever seen that before. It was yeah. weird. What, what are your thoughts on Sumich's comment? As someone who knows Zane, look, I know both those guys. Um, they're both really, really good people. Yeah. Um, but if I was in Peter's. Um, if I'm Peter, I would yeah. have just said to clubs, look, this is something I've noticed in Zane's mm. game. He's still 18. It's just a part of his game you're going to have to iron out. And I think Zane wouldn't have slid as far as what he did. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, just for clarity, he said this on the radio, yes, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. So, yeah. yeah. So, when, when, so when I say that, I would have just spoken to clubs. Sure. When, yeah. uh, say, an Essendon comes to me and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to talk, I would have just... Being honest. Said it just... Yeah. yeah. It, you have to be, because... For sure. The last thing you'd want to do is... Um, say this kid is just fantastic his free roof attitude's great and then he turns out to be a bit of a Dale Garland it, Elijah Taylor and then suddenly yeah, the club's yeah. gone well we're not going to deal with you anymore yeah, you're yeah. lying totally um, agree so I understand from Peter's perspective he had to do that but I personally wouldn't have gone on a 6PR and SEN and oh, fully bagged yeah. the kid out but the other thing is it probably would have been good to also maybe get Zane one on one with Peter before this and say look this is what I'm going to say um, and the other thing is some clubs, AFL clubs do it where they might publicly give their player a bag and then they respond. So if I was to speak to Zane today or tomorrow, I'd just say, mate, use this as motivation, come out firing, hit a few bodies in the preseason and make you, make yourself go into uh, starting 22 selection. Mm. Um, and look, knowing Zane, he'll certainly do that. He's a fantastic kid. He's not a sook. Um I think a fair thing to say is this year Swan District's Colts team didn't have a great year. I yep. think they won two or three games. Um, and, you know, you could see that Zane might have been a bit exasperated in those games because he was sure. trying so hard to lift that team. Interesting. And Interesting. I know in the preseason he was pretty keen to try and uh, play uh, some senior league football for Swans. Um and an interesting thing is, in the preseason, he was playing games against Sam Fisher and was doing very well against mm. this year's Sandover medalist. So yeah. he's certainly got the talent. Um, it's just if he applies himself. That's interesting. Really good insight. I, one thing I did like in his interview, uh, his press conference after becoming an Eagle. This is Zane we're talking Zane about. Zane True, yeah. yeah, correct. So he was asked about the Swimmage's comments and he just gave it an absolute straight bat. He says, oh, I don't really concern myself with that. I can't really control it. Um, all yep. I'm going to do is put my best foot forward. I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. I thought that was a very mature response to what was a difficult question in his first press conference oh, as an AFL player. To flat bat it like that, I thought that was a very mature response and it can't possibly be entirely true. Now, I'm sure he's the sort of player who, who would be motivated to, to you know, oh, yeah. take, but I mean, he's human and if somebody yeah. gave me a spray in public, I would be pissed. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe maybe he uses his motivation. That's cool. And that, that's what I would implore for him to do. Yeah. Just use his motivation, hit the bodies, but even just go up to Luke Shuey and just keep asking him questions sure. about the game. Go up to Jack Redden, ask him questions about the game. Yeah. And look, from not being within that club, but looking from the outside, they've really got that culture where they all buy in, they mm. all mentor each other. And look, for Eagles fans' sake, hopefully they'll be right up the top contending again. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and I mean, even if it if it was true, and I'm not saying it is because I, yeah. I don't know, yeah. but um, even if it was true, he's an 18-year-old kid. So yeah. you, like I was immature at 18 and yeah. I'm sure we all were. So yeah. Still am at 25 yeah, in my yeah. case. Yeah, I suck. Um, <laughs> nah. I was I, saying, my case, I wasn't bagging you. I no, that's all right. Chipping we'll, myself there, don't worry. We'll move on to Fred. Before we move on to Fred, I just, uh, as a player comparison for, for an Eagles fan who might not have seen true much, like yeah. who would you compare him to at AFL level? Uh, someone like a Trent Cotchin. Okay. So, yeah. you know, that I think I remember saying inside, that, outside midfielder yeah. uses it really well. Probably better by hand than he is foot. Cool. Um, so, again, like as I was saying with Jack when we were on that podcast, um, 
you know, if you can really develop those kicking skills, suddenly you become more of a target player. And you look at that Eagles midfield, Shui can kick it, Tim can kick it, Yo mm. can kick it, Gaff can kick it. So suddenly, when you build up that really good, skillful team, it's hard to um, uh, clamp them all down. Yeah. And another boy who I really want, if I can go a little bit into, yeah. is Isaiah Winder. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a boy who had the onus put on him at the start of this year. And look, he handled it with aplomb. He tested really, really well. Um, and look, there's a half forward spot available. So like Zane, he's really just got to put his best foot forward. And I know he will. And look, the spot's there if he wants it. But he's got to make it his now. Another player who slid a little bit. I think the Eagles did benefit from two players going a bit later than we expected. Yeah. Zane True and Winder. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I'll, I'll just say this um, as a Eagles are better than Dockers thing. No, but um, Toomey <laughs> had tr- True in his top 30 and not O'Driscoll. But we'll, yes. I guess we'll get to that when we cover yeah, O'Driscoll. Yeah. But um, I thought that was fascinating. But anyway, um, two players that could conceivably have gone in the top 30 and no one really would have batted an eyelid. And the Eagles have got them in the 50s. I'm pretty happy with that, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. The thing I like about Windows, again, not an expert, but having a look at his stats... His production's pretty good for yeah. a high impact player. So, yeah. uh, I mean, he's athletically blessed, skillful, yeah. fast, um, plays in the gut. Yeah. But he's also had games where he's had high 20 possessions. I think he averaged 28 possessions at yeah. Colts, if I read that correctly. Yeah. 14 of those contested. Yeah. Um, so, um, the thing though I loved about those stats five tackles a game. Yeah. It shows that he, he's two way, he's not just a front runner. Mm. Um, and look, he also played some senior football for Peel this yeah. year, and he had some really good games just playing half back and half forward. Probably didn't have the body or the uh, durability to go right into the midfield, but yeah, I know he uh, certainly impressed in those league games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll um, we'll talk about Fremantle a little bit, um, yep. and I'm sure you're both gagging to talk a little bit about Fremantle because yep. again, they've gone very local. I think only they might have. T- is Tracy the no, rookie? He's, he's, he's Victorian. Victorian. Yeah. So other than that, they've gone completely local. Um, we'll start at the top with Heath Chapman. Um, he was a player that you called. We're gonna Fremantle. We're gonna take take the punt. Yep. Pretty happy to end up in purple? Yeah, I am. Um, look, I know everyone that follows Fremantle is going to say we've got too many tools. We've sure. Got too many backs is the other Yeah, one. blah, blah, blah. The thing though is Alex Pierce was out injured last year. Yeah, Joel Hemling out. So suddenly when they go, yeah, our depth or Fremantle's depth was a little bit tested. Mm. Um, and the other thing with Chappie that I really like is he can play on a wing. Um, and then I think I said in the live stream, once he starts to put on a bit more size, uh, gets that real contested side of his game improved. He can go into the midfield and look. He's one ninety three centimeters. You get him up to ninety kegs. Suddenly, that's a very scary midfielder. Yeah. Uh, to, <laughs> to use. Um, and he's a beautiful kick in the football. True. Yeah. And he seems to have a good head on his shoulders. Interviewed pretty well from the, the press conference that I saw. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think maybe. Maybe Fremantle just rate the guys who can launch attacks from the back half. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. uh, by comparison, the Eagles love to pick up half forwards. I don't know why. It's just it's a, it's a vogue selection at the moment for the, for the Eagles, and maybe Fremantle are just thinking yeah. they'll load up on guys who can sort of drive the ball from the back half because it's important I to think their game plan. We've gone back to West Coast. You know, Lacroix left. Yeah. They still don't know what's happening with Willie. Yeah. Venables is still suffering. Concussion yeah, he's, you'd bank on him not playing, but hopefully he I know, I know he can. they re-rookied him. But yeah. So suddenly there's probably that half-forward spot that they're probably lacking at the moment. Yeah. Um, so that's probably why they're looking at it. But um, look, and that's why I said, is he winter? He's just got to put his head down and yeah. hopefully he'll play some games for you guys next year. I would love that. I would love that. Um, so Fremantle went another WA boy with the next pick, uh, Nathan O'Driscoll, who... Yeah. Drewsy was quite just, happy. Drewsy just plucked him as the player he wanted drafted. And, yeah. um, Do you watch his video the other day about yeah. the Four Dockers ones, how he had the clips from the... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He <laughs> asked me to prepare yeah. that video for him, and I was like, no, nah, I can't be bothered. Um, <laughs> but no, nah, no, nah, it was a good video. Go check out Drewsy's channel. Uh, but O'Driscoll, Perth Demon Boy. So naturally, I like him already. I always yeah. have an, like a, a, a... What's the word? Affection, I guess, for Perth Demon's uh, prospects. O'Driscoll, though, are you pretty happy to see him at 27, which was quite... Quite yeah. late, I guess, for his range. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, he was that top 15, top 30 talent. Um, a great leader. Um, and that's something with all of the Fremantle players. Um, I'll say apart from Tracy, just because I don't know Josh Tracy. But yeah. um, the four local boys they picked up all could all be leadership group members within two or three years' time. So um, just looking at their draft hall and look that they, you could argue they were a top five club in terms of the draft night. Um and you know what they're really building is that skillful leadership group with our team which is what west coast has implemented and you know a good club like richmond has implemented so look they're certainly on the right path it's now just about i suppose fully gelling and hopefully uh seeing free- that growth yeah and hopefully Fremantle. <clears throat> so Fremantle fans can uh 
sitting at club playing finals in the not too near just too far future yeah for sure for sure i think i think it's fair to say Fremantle um have done well did you i was very happy you were very that, happy yeah, yeah i think it caps off a probably a three-year period where you've drafted very yeah. well i think drusy was saying and i don't agree with him here but he said in his video he said this compares well to the chero brayshaw draft and not, last year's draft and i think it's got a long game. way to go before you catch up particularly on last year's draft last year's was ridiculous caleb so. sarong and yeah. then hayden young and yeah, then, then liam henry who haven't even, even seen frederick's him. late he's yeah. played some games he's got some upside yeah, yeah. but i mean yeah, I mean, it's potential to cap off a neat little yeah. recruiting period. Probably just the key forward is the next thing to add. Yeah. Um, Although, from what I saw in the highlights, Josh Tracy looks like yeah. very exciting. Oh, really? I think yeah. it was in his second highlight, you just saw him deliver this great front on hip and shoulder. Yeah. The bloke's just gone absolutely flying. So, <laughs> if you've got a big bollocking key forward that can kick some goals, that, mm. that should hopefully hold yeah. Fremantle in good stead. True, very true. We'll talk about a couple of players maybe that didn't get picked up because every year this list is... Um, it's fairly long. Actually, this year, maybe it's just my lack of awareness, but no, there was a few that... Uh, there was less that didn't get drafted that I was surprised about. But um, is there anyone you sort of nominate that you thought would go and didn't? Yeah. Oh, look, I think uh, just from the get-go, when there's only 59 picks yeah. in a national draft, there's always going to be probably a lot more kids that don't get looked at. Yeah. And in the rookie draft, it just looked like there was a lot of um, rookie upgraded picks. Mm. Uh, yeah, a lot of guys just, just getting redone. Yeah, in the second round in particular, I yeah, think a lot of them were just upgrades. Yeah. So yeah. I think this was always going to be a year where yeah, we're going to see some talented kids not get picked up. But yeah. that's also really exciting for state leagues. You know, mm. the WAFL is going to get stronger. True. SNFL is going to get stronger. VFL will get stronger. Um, look, one boy who I thought could have been a chance was a kid called Xavier Ma from the Murray Bush Rangers. He's a big body midfielder. Uh, Henry Walsh, who is Sam Walsh's brother. <laughs> yeah. um, he's a ruckman and look, good ruckman, don't grow on trees. Um, you got Max Heath, a ruckman from Sandringham Dragons that could have been looked at. Mm. Two boys from WA in Blake Morris, who won the flag this year with Subiaco. And then you had Kellen Lane, a boy from Denmark. Um, and he's a ruckman who was playing at Claremont this year and showed some really good signs. But look, as I said, when there's only 59 picks, it's you're always going to lose out on some talent. For context, I think that's a good 10 to 20 picks less than the average, yeah. would you say? 59 is probably the, the shallowest draft I've ever seen. Yeah, I think that's... Right. Mm, like, from probably the first draft of all time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, well, what yeah. are actually doing? It would take him one pick, two picks. So. Yeah, exactly right. So I think in the modern draft, that's the, the longest one for probably 20 plus years, if I had to guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of talented kids missed out, I'm sure. Walsh's brother was one that I think everyone, not everyone, but I think that he was one that was it's generally probably talked the about. the most romantic one, because yeah. you know, his brother on the rising star, True. what's he going to do? Exactly. But maybe in a way it's good for him, because you know, if he comes in suddenly, there's all that extra pressure on him, you know, is your, your brother's so much better than you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a bit like what happened with the Ablets, uh, yeah. a bit like what happened going to NBA context for you, the Curry brothers, you know, you've got sure. Steph who's just out of this world yeah. and you've got Seth who's a very good player but yeah. because his brother's out of the world yeah. um, but look for all of them I just implore all of them to go back to their clubs or state, hopefully our state league club and just play some really good football that will catch the eye of recruiters yeah I agree I think we were saying this in Jack's podcast um, another boy who was unlucky to miss out yeah. but I think this is one of the better years to, to miss out in that there's going to be a lot of eyes on the kids that missed out in yeah. terms of um, you know, maybe they didn't have enough data on them last year, and next year with a greater opportunity. Obviously, it's, it's like in Jack's case, his projection, his uprising in 2020. If he continues that, then he's going to be massively draftable next yeah. year. When 2019, he didn't necessarily have a big year. There's going to be potentially a mid-season draft, train yeah. ons throughout the yeah. season. So, yeah, there's going to be opportunities. Well, I was just half. Oh, you go. People might not know about is over summer, each club can have up to five kids train with them, mm -hmm. and that's not the AIS under 18 boys training with them. So, yep. they can even pick up mature age draftees. So, for instance, even someone like a Jai Bolton or Hayden Schleif could train with a female on West Coast. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, maybe they both go, yep, let's pick them up. But so, that's the other thing for the, especially. Well, from a WA perspective, if they get asked to train with a female or West Coast, put your best foot forward, crash into those bodies, really just learn for those few weeks while you're there. And you never know, a club might just go, yep, we're going to take you. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say with Jack specifically quick, like because they'll have a 19s championship this year. Someone like him might get an opportunity to excel in that even more than he would have excelled hypothetically in this year's because he would have had to compete with like a Denver Granger Barras for that key position spot, that sort of thing. Mm. So, oh. so sort of like maybe some of those second tier talents will... Yeah. 
a year develops so they'll have that advantage over the guys who are a year younger so they'll sort of be able to sort of show a bit more in that sense I think maybe I mean Jack can probably even grow that's the thing that's the thing like we were saying to what Jack was saying he's, he's enlisted at 189 right he's Which, about 191 yeah at least so and then he's at 18 I hadn't stopped growing by 18 so by next year he could be like 193 194 so yeah. it becomes far more draftable um, when you're looking at it in that, those terms um, I guess before we round up sort of towards the end of this potty mate is there anyone that you'd like to nominate as having a great day in terms of clubs like oh. you know they've had a great haul or, or they've made a great pick here is there anyone you'd yeah. like to acknowledge I think I think Essendon were the big winners. Yeah. Um, and Sydney, I'd probably say those were the two big winners. Mm. Um, I think Fremantle did very well. Um, yeah, West Coast, who I thought did very well considering how far back they were For in the sure. draft. For I sure. think, though, they... Um, I think something that will disappoint West Coast was they had their eyes on a young fella called Tyler Brockman. Yeah. Um, and I think they were really trying to... Um, trade up during uh, the trade sorry the draft period to mm. uh, get a pick to land him sure um, and look Tyler's an absolute great story the work that he put in and Subiaco put in um, he's come from a long way back um, for those who don't know he's actually the nephew of former Docker and Gold Coast player Greg Broaden yeah I remember saying that actually yep. yeah. and for just a bit of context about him taking away this bloke's off field like just for the time being just think of him early days Gold Coast when he was dominating games he's a bit like that Harley Bunnell mm. sort of play that half forward that can go in the midfield um, and look Hawthorne's got a beauty in him yeah yeah I, uh, I did I was a little bit annoyed not because I really had seen him myself but I just knew the Eagles were linked to him so to see him go at like 45 I was a little bit like that's a burn I did see one article very very cheekily wrote the article that the Eagles missed out on and is that were badly burnt by the by their rivals Hawthorne so yeah. Hawthorne had stolen Brockman from us and then therefore we had a terrible draft That's that was the way the article was written that kind of burned me but that being said it would have been great I to land him I think that's a pretty average way to put it yeah it was out a- it was going for a headline for sure yeah. and I, I would generally like you said considering how far the Eagles were back I'm very happy with yeah. how they did in the same way I'm very happy with how we did in the trade period considering we had yeah. nothing to start with so I think for West Coast fans out there like yourself they got their list needs mainly through the trade period. Like, they needed a halfback flanker. They got that through Witterden. Yeah. And they probably needed that half-forward midfielder, and they got that through Zach Langdon. So, yeah. the rest of them... And look, True and Izzy were supposed to go top 30. Yeah. Late picks. That's beautiful. I don't know too much about Luke Edwards. Sure. So... But, yeah, overall, I think the Eagles did really well. We, did, we needed young midfielders, definitely. Yeah. Um, and you could argue that all three of those prospects are potentially midfielders at the next level. So very happy with that. Um, I was going to ask you, has anyone had a shocker? Again, this is not a great question to ask for the draft because you can't assess it straight away. Like I said, you know, in 2015 when Adelaide took Dode, I would have been like, oh, it's a shocker because nobody knows who he is. And he turned out to be like, oh, he didn't win the rising star, did he? But he got close, I think. I think think. he got Mm. second. Second, yeah. So there you go. But I mean, yeah, is it fair to say that no one's had a shocker yet? No, I think that's probably more a question you have to ask in 12, 24, yeah. 36 months. Mm. Um, it's very hard right now. And it's almost also in a way, if you say a club's done badly, the kids that got drafted to that club, it's almost like you're pissing on their statue sure. that they've just, um, <laughs> just got drafted. So look, I think congratulations to all the boys that got drafted. I think mm. each club will be absolutely happy with their draft hand. Other club. Some clubs might be happier than other clubs, so I think it's fair to say. Sure. But, um, yeah, I think that's a question you probably need to ask in 12 months. And really, with a draft, you probably need to... You can really only analyse it once it's pretty much completely yeah, done. So exactly. it's really only now that you can really do 01, you can only do 02, mm. 03, and all those drafts beforehand. Whereas yeah. even a draft like 2013, it's hard to analyse because you've still got all those players playing like Fife and Bond still have a lot of time to put runs on the board to be consolidate themselves as that top guy from that draft for example Mm, they're both still in their primes I've half-heartedly started the series and I'm going to continue over the summer where I do videos redrafting top 10s so I'm thinking about doing 2014 next and even that's only just starting to take shape like Petrarca would probably not have been picked one 18 months ago but Um, but if I do it like today, he might be. <laughs> you could do it at the end of next year. to go yeah. could be number one, number two. Yeah, so yeah. Like, I think Harris Andrews is that year as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces there. Um, but I've, I had a crack at 2017 12 months ago, yep. and I wouldn't be surprised if I watched it now. I think, wow, it's very different. I think Jaden Stevenson I had early, but then yeah. obviously he's been shipped off after yep. a terrible year. So, yeah, we'll see. It is early days. So um, Yeah, cool. All right, I think that probably 
more or less rounds up unless there's anything you really want to add about the uh, the draft review. Um, actually, I've got a question for you boys. Yeah. Is there any player who you think is the leading favourite for Rising Star? I can't believe I didn't ask this question. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I'm such a bad interview. Um, okay, let's, let's tease this one out. All right, so for me personally, talls generally don't win it. Because yeah. they need that extra year. The only one that might be an outlier here is Jamara Ugelhagen, who could potentially yeah. play as a bloody high half forward in his yeah. first year, get 15 touches a game and a goal, and he could win it. Mm-hmm. Um, but looking past pick one, um, Will Phillips potentially, but again, he's there's a little bit of a squeeze for minutes at Gold Coast if you're thinking about it. they've uh, got to get North games. Man. Sorry, I completely <laughs> had drafted Phillips to Gold Coast in my head there. Okay. No, in that case, then Phillips might get a crack. So I'd say Phillips is a candidate in the way that you could see him being a ready-made sort of option. So Similar to how Sarong yep. yeah, sort of and Raul yeah. um, yeah. just sort of coming in the guts. Um, beyond the top 10, I'm not too... Uh, I mean, I, I could see a Heath Chapman doing well. Mm. Um, a, a sort of in the back half player. I could, I could see it being a sort of like an outside player who who has the ball fed to him doing well. Yeah. Um, to stop me, like... Treading water with his hands. Is anyone in particular that you have in <laughs> mind? Good. Um, one boy from GWS is Connor Stone, the boy okay. who I mentioned before. Yep. I think he's Sunday leading candidate. And one absolute um, smoky mm. could be Jack Carroll, who went to oh, pick true. 41 when he was supposed to go pick 14. So yeah, And look, he'll probably play some games at Carlton as well. Mm. Um, so I think those two boys are players to watch. Sure. Yeah, I like that. Mm. I like that. I think it, I, to go against my tall thing, could see Denver having yeah, a good first Yeah, I was going to say Denver was yeah. my answer, actually, because yeah. I'd say slot straight into a Hawthorne system yeah. where he's going to have to step up and play a bit of that Sicily-style role yeah. who was like a predominant player in Hawthorne's yeah. structure. Could see him getting games, yeah. um, and he's played against men for two years. So yep. as an intercepting sort of play, like I could see yeah. I could see him yeah. getting enough of the ball to, um, to get a lot of interest. Archie Perkins is another one just because he's so explosive, sort of yeah. an exciting player. He might yeah. get a lot of attention, so... Yeah, if I had to say from the top ten, I'd probably, I'd probably still back in Jamara. Yeah, mm. because I think I surely think so. he gets games, right? Yeah. Surely, yeah. surely the dogs just chuck. Him they in. don't really have a key forward. The dogs. I mean, they got Norton, Norton if they yeah. don't throw Bruce, him back. Bruce, Bruce. Yeah. So yeah. Now it's interesting because Jamara goes into that team. Certainly, mm. Bruce and Shaky. Yeah. They have to start performing. So yeah. true. Do you think Jamara could in round one next year just be chucked on a forward flank and then still yeah. impact? Because yeah. that's probably how he would be more likely to win a. Mm. Rising star. Yeah, I think so. I think you saw it with Noah Anderson this year. He just went on a half-wood flank, got yeah. 15, 20 touches, a couple mm. goals here and there. Yep. He finished second, and luckily for the Dockers fans, Sarong beat him to win the Rising okay. Star. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I can certainly see Jamara playing on that half-wood flank. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's probably my number one call. I'd say Denver up there, Braden Campbell. I don't mind Logan, actually. Yeah. Depending on, like, Buddy and stuff's health, but even if Buddy's healthy, he's probably still that second key for him. Still it, getting a steady few plucks, few goals. Bearing in mind that Sydney's probably going to finish bottom six to eight, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. That's I true. Don't. But in saying that, they've got the talent to get him the ball like pretty well. Like even if they're not winning games, they've got the talent to get him the looks. Sure. That goal. Yeah. Um, wouldn't be my first pick. I'll say Jamara or Zane True. One of those two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nice. Nah. Nah. Nice. All right, cool, man. I think that's uh, time to, to wrap up True Footy Podcast 67. Thank you so much for your time, not just today, but pretty much since we started doing these podcasts like a month ago or whenever it was. <laughs> um, yeah, some of, probably some of the best podcasts we've done on the channel thanks to your insights. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, for anyone who's listening, check out manscaped.com uh, for your Christmas presents, 20% off with True Footy 20, 20, all caps or one word. Go check out Bush's uh, NBA channel as well if you like NBA. When's this? When's the season start? I've known nothing uh, about basketball. It starts like twenty second of December, eh? Okay, so Just yeah, quick little turn. Yeah, there was a couple of preseason games today, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, preseason started today. Yeah, because Frosty, I caught up with him yesterday. He was talking about getting league pass and watching preseason games. You have a podcast coming out soon? Yeah, well, I'm pretty much editing it now. It's it's been a slight pain in the ass, but it should be out probably tomorrow. That's hot. Hopefully. Cool. <laughs> uh, well, the link to that is in the description. Again, thank you, Lenny. And uh, we'll see you guys all in the next video. Cheers. Beautiful.